Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming and welcome to typical C++ but why, or maybe typical C++ but why. Um, I'm Bjorn Fanner. Um, I want to start this presentation with a, a bit of a digression. Uh, we go back in time 30 years, uh, summer of 1993. I was close to finishing my university studies, and I was doing the background work from a master's thesis, uh, a bit of a walk in that, I think, direction. Actually, a very long walk in that direction. I was at uh, UBC in Vancouver, three or four months. Uh, it's great to be back in Canada, even though it's uh, just for a very short visit this time. Um, so, here's a talk, typical C++, but why? Uh, Bjorn Faller, as I said, I, I'm not from here, obviously. Uh, I, I live in Sweden, in Stockholm, where I work for NetInsight. NetInsight makes network equipment like these, or those. Uh, there are, I don't know how many computers are on there. Every plugin board has at least two CPUs and at least one FPGA. We make, we make the mechanics, the hardware, electronics program, the FPGAs. The lot. We connect them in networks, of course, right? Everything up to the network management systems. And these are extremely popular with uh, broadcast media because we really know about the network latency, know exactly the delivery time for everything. So if you've watched anything live televised the last 15 years or so, you have probably indirectly used our stuff. Uh, but. Um, Enough about that. Let's uh, instead talk about jigsaw puzzles. Um, did you know that manufacturers of jigsaw puzzles have standard cutout patterns for, for their pieces? So that if you buy two different jigsaw puzzles from the same manufacturer with the same physical dimension and the same number of pieces, they are probably interchangeable. I didn't know that, but of course it makes perfect sense that that is the way it's done. Uh, artist uh, Tim Klein, with, with this uh, URL there, they visit the, the web shop, uh, definitely knows about this. Uh, Tim Klein has made this one and a bunch more that I'm going to, to show in this presentation. Uh, this behavior with the jigsaw puzzles that fit everywhere where they maybe shouldn't reminds me of the C++ type system. <laughs> uh, so the, the C++ type system has a, a, a small set of standard jigsaw puzzle piece shapes, uh, like the integer types or the floating point types. Uh, and as we know, they promote to each other hither and thither, whether you want it or not, uh, which is not great. But at the same time, C++ allows you to create your own shapes. And you can make them as generic or as specific as you want to. And developers usually create pieces. They create classes that make up the structure of the program, so you have all the monsters there, all the network connections there, all the requests waiting for a response here. Uh, but rarely do developers create types for the information passed between those pieces. And I want to change that. I, I quite subversively have this idea that when you go back to work after this conference, you will start to make changes to your code. So I intend to, to show this by, by, by showing a number of examples. The, the, the examples are completely made up things, but the, the problems that they show are problems that I have seen in real world code. I should also say that this is not a talk with complicated, difficult, advanced C++ at all. Uh, I ex fully expect a novice C++ developer to, to understand everything I talk about. And at the same time, I think even very experienced C++ programmers will 
learn new things, because it's not about new constructs, at least mostly not, but it's a way of using what you already know in ways you probably haven't thought about. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any time during the presentation. And let's get going. So, the wrong argument. So we have some kind of piece of code here. We, we want to react to some kind of user input that we, we read, and we know that users don't, aren't reliable, they aren't trustworthy, they create wrong kind of input, so we want to sanitize it, and then we can make a query with that data. And we log it so that we can see what is happening. But you can probably spot a bug here. <coughs> we actually made the query with the unsanitized input. No compiler is going to warn about this. There is nothing wrong here. Uh, the, since, since, since the sanitized input is logged, it's used. So the compiler will not complain in any way that the sanitized input is not used for anything. And you get this. You do not want your code to end up in an XKCD comic. You, you don't. Really, you don't. But what happened here? What, why? What, what can we do? Because the, the, the person that wrote this code knew about this problem. That, that's why the, the sanitized input uh, function exists. It, it's just an honest mistake. It, they happened to pass the uh, unsanitized input to to the query user data function. So what can we do about that? Well, one thing we can do is that we can make a change to sanitize input and query user data so that they used a, a sanitized string. So how can we create a sanitized string that makes it impossible to, do, to, to make this mistake? Well, we can do this. Struct sanitized string contains a string that is a value. Um, and if we do this, and we have this mistake in place, and we compile our code, we get this. Invalid initialization of reference to const sanitized string from std basic string. What happened here is that we transformed a customer bug report or a tricky debugging session into a compilation error. If you're lucky, in the previous case, you're, you would have had good enough test suites that maybe you would have captured this. My experience says you probably didn't. But there, there's just no way of ignoring a compilation error. <laughs> it's in your face. You, you cannot continue. You, you have to fix your problem. And that is actually a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. I think this is preferable. Uh, we can do better, though. We, we can create a, a somewhat better sanitized string. Uh, the problem with a struct is that you can, you can initialize it from uh, basically anything, and you can change it even though it was sanitized, uh, etc. So let's instead do it like this. We, we have a sanitized string class with uh, an explicit operator to, to examine the content. Uh, the way this works, by the way, the, the, this is called a conversion operator, if you're not familiar with it. So in this case, we have a, a function work that takes an int, and we have a function f that has a, a, an instance of c. And c, we want to call work with c, but c is not an int. But the compiler can see that, aha, an instance of C can be, has a conversion operator to int, so it can call this conversion operator to get the value and can make the call. Uh, we have this long, proud tradition in C++ of having all our defaults wrong. So it, it's, you, unfortunately, the, 
conversion operator can be called when you don't want it to. But by adding the explicit keyword, you, you say that only call this when I explicitly ask for it to be called. Don't let it accidentally happen. You can get the, one of the value ways you can get the, uh, call the conversion operator is with, with a static cost. You can also just say int brackets C, then you also create a, call, call the conversion operator and, and get your int. So with this, our sanitized string can then be used to explicitly get the underlying st string value that will be needed in, in the query user data implementation. Uh, we use a, a private version of the data so that no one by accident can happen to modify something that was sanitized into something that shouldn't be. Uh, and we have a constructor that is also explicit so that we don't just by random happen to initialize a sanitized string, but also that it, in, in the case that it is just too bad, it will throw an exception, which means that you, you really cannot by accident get an instance of a sanitized string that holds something that should not be used in a query. You, you have to resort to Machiavellian evil to get there. Which is, of course, exactly what we want. So if we then write our code like this, we, we get our sanitized input by creating a sanitized string with the input. We can log it, we query our user data with the sanitized input. And this is, in my opinion, it's very clean, it's very easy to read, it is very correct. And it actually takes an effort to, to cause a mess with this. This is good. So to summarize, even just a very simple struct eliminates a whole class of runtime errors, moves them into compilation errors. Uh, private data and the throwing constructor makes the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard. You, you have to make an effort to do the wrong thing. And almost always use explicit for conversion operators and for constructors, at least for the single argument constructors. Questions about this? Yeah, right. That one is called the Trinosaurus Rex. It is nice. So, we have some kind of print function. It takes a, a, a string view and we have some flags. Do we want to truncate the, the print if it's too long for some internal buffer? Uh, do we want to pad it if it's not long enough to, to fill it? And do we want to add a line feed at the end? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Now th this, the call site looks, uh, actually looks quite reasonable. You, you can see exactly, or the, sorry, not the call site, the function signature makes sense. It looks all right. You, you can understand what it's meant. This, on the other hand, <laughs> is a nightmare. The, this is, Completely incomprehensible. If you, if you see this print foo false false true somewhere where you don't have a, the function signature immediately above it, you have absolutely no clue of what true true false means or false false true. And also, uh, so a technique that is used in some cases is to create local variables here with the names that says do truncate equals true, do, do do not pad equals false, et cetera, and call with those. And that creates the illusion of making the code more understandable. But the problem is if you confuse the order of the arguments in the call, it still looks like it makes perfect sense, but it's a lie because everything are, they're just bools, they're interchangeable. And then the code doesn't at all do what it looks like it's doing. So, what can we do? Well, one technique is to use enum class. 
Note specifically enum class, not, not the traditional C style enum because that is just a glorified int. Uh, but an enum class creates a unique type. Each of these are unique types of their own. They are different. They happen to have the same uh, enumerators off and on. And when called, we can say print foo with truncate off, pad off, line feed on. This is readable, unlike foo false false tree. Um, it's a bit verbose, I agree. But I think in this case, this is a verbosity that adds to the comprehension for the reader. Uh, it's a good thing. And since these are unique, different types that are not interchangeable, if you happen to call them in the wrong order, you will get a compilation error. It would say, I have no idea how to convert a pad colon colon off into a truncate, for example. So again, we have transformed a, a debugging session into a compilation error. Yay. Although, that is a bit of an eyesore. I, I'm not happy about that. I, I have not figured out a, a naming convention for, for the parameters that looks good. You, you should, come up with synonyms or whatever, it's, ah, it's ugly. But I, I think it's worth the ugliness, because you gain so much more. So, to begin with, you almost never actually want bool parameters, especially not in a function that wants several bool parameters. And enum class adds the, the good kind of verbosity that enhances readability. And again, since they are unique types, if you accidentally call with the, with the arguments in the wrong order, you will get a compilation error. That is good. All clear? So let's go on to a different one. I've forgotten the, I've forgotten the name of that one. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, dangerous defaults, yes. Oh, scary stuff. So we have pretty much the same code as before, but we realize that actually it makes sense. You, you almost always want a line feed at the end, so let's default it, and you, you have to explicitly make an exception when you, when you don't want it. That yeah, makes sense. Uh, I mean, this is absolutely horrible code for the reasons you, you saw earlier, but it, it, it's, it, it works. Uh, a synonymous case of this was actually one that caused a, a few colleagues mine. Maybe, I don't remember, it's, it's been a few years, but maybe two years, or two, two days of, of uh, troubleshooting. Uh, because what they wanted to do was this. You realize that, wait a minute, uh, having this field width uh, be Implicit is maybe not a good idea. Maybe we should be explicit about this. So, so it's added as a parameter. So we have a new one here. Size T field. Good. Except this code still compiles. It calls print with the string foo, a field size of zero, trunk of false, and pad of true, and line feed of true. No compiler wants for this, because a Boolean is an unsigned integer type. That size t is also an unsigned integer type. The value space of size t is enormously much larger than that of, of bool, and, and they, they fit perfectly. So this is fine. Absolutely no problem with this, as far as the compiler is concerned. But when this print function is used in thousand places in your code and you make this change, what are the chances that you found all the, all the places that you should make a change to? Not many, not, not good. But again, exactly the same trick as before. Use, use enum class. Because then we get a compilation error saying that 
I don't know how to convert truncate off to a size T. I mean, we still have a lot of work to, to fix all these uh, coincides, but at least the compiler helps us to say where we should make it. So, yeah, uh, uh, compilation error driven design. Uh, an alternative solution is, of course, to make a, a unique type for, for size T instead, for the field, instead of using size T. Or actually both. Okay. There is a difference with, with this one and the ones I showed you previously. The, the ones I showed you previously were about honest mistakes when you write the code. And this one is a danger when the code evolves. It was fine, but you made a change and suddenly everything blew up. So default parameters are dangerous over time. They're not necessarily dangerous when you write the code, especially if the types in the, in the function are interchangeable. And interchangeable may not be as obvious as you may think, like bool to size t. It's not obvious that that is, uh, that that is a, a conversion that is just perfectly all right, just not what you expect it to be. And yes, using unique and non-convertible types catches this problem. You, you still have a lot of work to do, but the compiler helps you. This one is called How the West Was Won. I've done a lot of networking uh, in my career. And uh, networking APIs often look like this. You, you, you deal with packets as raw contiguous re regions of memory that you you look at as bytes. Uh, so in this case, we constitute eight T star and a length. And uh, here, when we receive a packet, it's a binary protocol of some kind. We, we parse a header, and then we want to copy the payload after the header. So we take the buffer, we have extracted the header, so we know how long it is. We copy the payload after the header, You see a problem here? So have a buffer overrun. We, we read past what we are allowed to, to see. We're copying unknown data or crashing. If you're lucky, you're crashing. So the problem is that we have two parameters here, buffer and buffer length that are used to, to mean one thing. They, they, these two things, uh, that are, they are their own entities, but they, they don't mean anything on their own. They mean something together only. So maybe we should have a type that instead that represents this contiguous memory area. So we can do it like this, I, a simple buffer view something that lets you inspect the memory area. And uh, I use, in this case, just const public members. Const is good because then you know that it, can, it, it doesn't get invalidated. You, you cannot mutate it. It doesn't get to something that is incorrect. And we have functions that can get subviews. Give me the prefix for the first len number of bytes or the suffix after the first len number of bytes. Uh, you have a design choice to make here. What should you do if the length you ask for is more than the actual available buffer size? Well, I choose to truncate. You may choose to abort or throw an exception. Uh, maybe if we time travel a little bit in, into the future, maybe place a contract on it, I don't know. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I choose to just 
truncate uh, and give you the, the, the shorter thing that, that works. So then we change our code to use this buffer view, and we say, parse the header, give me the header, and then copy the payload of the packet with the suffix after the header's length. I claim that this shows the intent much clearer. It may still be wrong, but since the, the code now talks about what it wants to do, it's much easier for someone who reads the code to, to see, wait, is this, is this actually what it should do? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it is what it should do. It's probably correct. Although immutable members aren't that great. You, you cannot assign to them, which means that you, they are, for example, if you have them in a vector and you want to remove some element in the middle of the vector, you will get a compilation error because it expects to be able to, to assign, and you will not be able to assign to something that has const members. So maybe our buffer view should be a little bit more sophisticated. We, we can create one that has uh, the, again, I'm using the start and length uh, as before, but now they are, they are mutable, but they are private, so no one can, by accident, or malice, change them. Well, by malice they can. UB, you can do anything with UB. Uh, but you, you cannot accidentally corrupt these. Uh, you need some kind of access functions to be able to get to the data. I choose to have begin and end because that is uh, plays nicely with range four and a lot of algorithms, so why not? However, Please, please, please resist the temptation to add too much. It is so easy when you start writing convenience clauses like this to say, oh, and this would be a cool thing to have. I'm not sure someone will need it. And let's add this. This is a, this is a very useful thing, probably, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is hard for the less experienced developer to appreciate how rarely architecturing for future requirements or applications turns out net positive. Do the things that you need now, because you know that that is needed. So do it right away. And here's the secret. It's software, you can change it. If you find out that what you added wasn't enough, something is missing. You can add it, you're allowed to do that. These are not written in stone by God Almighty. You, you, you can go there and just add one more function. It's okay. So do that, make the minimum interface that you know that you need right now. Not more, definitely not less. And add stuff if it needs to be added. So when you have several parameters together that describes one thing, try to model that as one type. This is actually also one of the reasons that ranges are excellent. Because you're, you're dealing with the range instead of the begin and end that are used to describe a range. Ranges are excellent for other reasons also, but that is one reason. Now, I should mention that in C20 we have to span. Don't use span in the uh, function parameters uh, as I showed you. The reason for that is that span is very generic. You can do a lot of things with it, which is good, but it's probably not what you want to express in, in your API. You want to express in your API that these functions deal with packet buffers packet views, not arbitrary contiguous ranges of bytes that come from wherever. But if you do program in C++20 and have access to Stutzpan, why not implement buffer view in terms of Stutzpan? That is a good thing. Then you don't have to do the pointer arithmetics yourself. That is good. That is a game. But don't use span directly as your parameter types. And I say that as someone who has done that. 
it, it, it seemed like a very good idea at the time. It wasn't. Questions on, on the previous, by the way? Yeah, too many defaults. So we have some kind of notion of a, a server socket. This is quite contrived, I know, I'm sorry. But so, so we say that I can create a server socket, I give it with which uh, port it should use, should it be TCP or UDP, which address should it bind to. The, it, it makes perfect sense to default to 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0, which is any network address that this machine has. But you may want to specify us a specific address. Uh, you're probably not using multicast, so having that as a, an optional that defaults to null opt makes perfect sense, but you, you can give it a multicast address if you need to. And do you want the I.O. to be blocking or non-blocking? You probably want it non-blocking. So, yeah, this is great, except what if I want to create my socket with the, the defaults are fine, except I, I actually want this to be blocking. We don't have named parameters in C++, so everything is given, you have to give the arguments in the order where they, they are shown there, uh, which means you have to list everything, which means that the value of having defaults just falls apart. But what you can do is instead to say, no, Let's create a, a configuration struct. The, and we use the member initializers for, for the defaults. So if you just create a config, you, you will have these, uh, these default values for everything unless you specifically say otherwise. And C20's uh, designated initializer lists makes this awesome. So now I'm just calling my service socket and say, yeah, port 1666, local host, and I want blocking IO. Great. If you're unlucky enough not to use C20, I'm afraid you have to do like this. You, you create your config and then you make the changes that you need to and you make the call. This is probably not a problem. In, in this particular case with, uh, with string use and uh, uh, integers, basically, it, it definitely isn't a problem. But omitting port is not an error. It is well defined in the language what happens if you forget to say something about port. Uh, the latest GCC is uh, actually one for this. If you have, a, uh, I think it's under W extra. I forget the exact warning. But uh, I have completely failed to get uh, Clang and MSVC to say anything about this at all. Because from a language point of view, there, there is nothing weird going on here. It's just doing something that is probably not what you want. So, what can we do? The most advanced piece of code that I'm showing in this presentation it is advanced because it is a template. Um, so must init of t has a private t as its value. And since I have an init, a constructor for it that takes a value, it means that the compiler will not emit a, uh, a default constructor for this type. So the, which is exactly what we want. We do not want to be able to default construct this. Uh, and then access the underlying values. Now I know I'm just contradicting what I said a number of slides earlier about almost always wanting these uh, access conversion operators to be explicit. 
I think that in this case, it's okay to not have them explicit because in this case, we want an instance of must init T to be, for all practical purposes, be a T. We just want to ensure that it's not default constructed. But of course, if you want to make them explicit, that is not wrong. So when we have this, we change our code to use must init of in 16T for the port. And now, failure to give a value to, to the port member is a compilation error. Vastly preferable over wondering why on earth it tried to bind to port zero. So creating structs with parameters is especially useful when you have many and when many of them have reasonable defaults. Because it, it makes it so easy to just have the defaults and be explicit about the deviations from the defaults that, that you want. And this is, of course, extra useful in C++20 and later because of the designated initializer syntax. Playing in the wrong key. This is the most contrived example. I'm really sorry. I, I apologize about it. It shows the point. So we have some kind of control of network sessions, and we have both client sessions and service sessions going on. And we have maps of them. And the clients are identified by, well, client IDs, and the servers are identified by server IDs, service sessions. So we have this function closed server that takes a server ID and, oops. This was probably not what was intended. The compiler is not, will not complain at all because a type alias is essentially a comment. It says, yeah, this is an int. Uh, Please only use it as you have, as something that you have obtained as a client ID. But if you want to do this with something you got from some arithmetic calculation or whatever, be my guest. It's an int. The name is a comment. The compiler doesn't read comments. But what we can do, again, we can revisit the enum class. The enum class got a new, uh, new use case in, in, from C++17, where you can just say enum class client ID colon int. Note that there are no enumerator values in there. So this means that for all practical purposes, this is a handle that is implemented in terms of an int. And so is server ID. And these are unique and different types. They are not interchangeable. But you need C17 and later, I hope you all use that. And with this, again, we have moved a debugging session into a compilation error. That is a net gain. So how does this work? Well, the compiler, when you, when you have this enum class, in this case client ID, colon int. You, you can create it with an arbitrary int value, like you see uh, to the right there, uh, with just uh, the, the curly braces. You can copy them. You can get the underlying value with uh, a static cost, say, please give me the underlying int. Pretty please. Uh, in uh, 23, you can also have std2 underlying. You can write that yourself if you want to. It's actually not a, at all a difficult function to write. But I'm leaving that as an exercise. And the compiler also creates the equality and ordering comparisons, which means that it works perfectly as keys in a map.
So now we have a solution. This work, we, we don't get this kind of error. What we can say, though, if, if we look at this, it's kind of verbose. So we say close, close server with the server ID and close client with the client ID. And these are unique types. So this is a bit redundant. We, we already have the information in the types. The type itself carries the intent. So what we, what we can do, if we want to, is to say just close session and we have overloads for server ID and for client ID. You can do that because client ID and server ID are now different, unique types. They are not interchangeable. You can overload on them. Now, whether you want to make this overload or not is a discussion that can be had. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But now when they are unique, non-interchangeable types, you have the choice. Before, with the, with the uh, type aliases, which are, as I said, they are, they are essentially comments. You cannot overload on comments. You, you cannot overload on different uh, type aliases because they are not unique types. They, they are just another name for int. So use this. This is good. But what if the keys are, that I want aren't actually of integer types? Because the enum class only works with integers. We, some languages are much more liberal in what they accept as the underlying types of enums, but C++ is not one of them. It, they must be an integ integral type. You cannot have enum class client ID of std string. The language does not allow it. But we can, of course, write our own. We can write a server ID, in this case, something that we have a string as a private value, an explicit constructor, so that we cannot just accidentally get a, a server ID from a string, an explicit access function, the conversion operator, in this case, the string view, so that we cannot by mistake, mutate it into something it shouldn't be. And C++ 20's absolutely magical Starship operator is just what, we, what you want. It's what happens here when you, when you write like this, uh, order operator spaceship equals default. The compiler will generate code that has all the comparisons for the members of this class. If you have more than one member, the uh, ordering operators will be a, a lexical graphical compare in the order they are listed as members. This is awesome. If you don't have C20, uh, you, I'm sorry, you have to write a lot of boilerplate code to get the comparisons. It's just like. Uh, Upgrade to 20. This is awesome. It makes life so much easier. So again, for, what is it, fourth time, enum class? Enum class is great when the underlying type is, is uh, of an integral type. And C plus 20 operator space trip is amazing. It saves you so much boring, tedious boilerplate typing. Use that. So, I have been speaking way, way, way too fast, but. Yeah. There's nothing magical with types in modern C. You, you have, we have had them since before it was even standardized. Uh, I landed my first C program in Java in 94. You may remember that the first standard came out in 98. We used types in 94. You can do that. It was a heck of a lot more tedious back then, but you can. Types reduce the risk of calling functions with the wrong values or in the wrong order. 
they can help you reduce the risk that dependent values diverge. Remember the uh, network packet buffer that we had a view to. Instead of having a start and a length or a start and a begin and end like you have in, in the STL, have a range, a, a view, something that expresses the thing, the, the contiguous, in this case, the contiguous memory area. Types can make it easier to, to manage defaults. You saw the configuration struct, which is quite easy to handle. And they can help prevent accidental uninitialized data. You saw this must init template. Feel free to copy it, royalty free, I promise. Uh, there's no denying that the more modern C++ you have, the, the easier it gets. You have so many useful conveniences that are added with every new version. These types make your APIs more expressive. That is, in my opinion, the most important thing. Because what happens when you add these types is that the different parts of your program that communicate with each other, they start communicating in terms of the problem domain instead of in the mechanisms used to solve the problems. So instead of ints, there are handles. Instead of raw pointers, there are buffer views, etc. It makes the code easier to read, easier to reason about. A really important bit is at the bottom that you rarely know which types you need when you start programming. At least I don't. You, you discover this as the code evolves. You, you start realizing that, wait a minute, these things, these aren't actually generic ints. They, they mean something. They, they should be a specific type. You discover that. And you, you write that type, and you incorporate it into your code as you discover these. And what you get then is the inverse of code rot. The, as time goes, as you make more modifications, as you realize more and more what types you need, the code becomes more and more expressive because it starts to communicate in terms of the problem domain. But this is, of course, only if you actually get those types into your program. And I will not lie to you, this can sometimes be painful. It, it, it can be. But not doing it is more painful in the long run. So do this. If you want to learn a little bit more about how to use types, I, I can recommend a, a talk from a year ago by Shanda Dargo. He looked specifically at having containers and want to make different types for different containers that are, the, the underlying container is actually the same. And he, he tries di many different ways of doing this uh, and discusses back and forth the pros and cons of the different approaches. So well worth watching, in my opinion. If you want to dive a little bit deeper, P Peter Sommelad, who is in this conference, is not in this room as far as I can see, uh, made this talk, what, what classes we design and how. It is a really interesting talk because what he does is he identifies that there are a number of, there are only so many kinds of types that you want. And for each kind of type, there are some different rules for, do, do you want them to, do you want them to be movable, for example? Do you, do you want them to be arithmetic, do you want them to be whatever. Uh, watching this talk will make you think a little bit more about how do you write these types so that there are better types that match better in the, in the whole system with, with fewer surprises. Highly recommended. And uh, visit Tim Klein's uh, website. Uh, this is all these uh, amazing artworks that I showed. There are many more. These are for sale, actually. 
Uh, absolutely no affiliation whatsoever. I just think they're awesome. I hope you agree. And uh, here's how you can spam me if that is your thing. Uh, and thank you very much for your kind attention.